Hallelujah. We greet all of you who are joining us online. We have an awesome church community online, and we thank God that our subscription on YouTube, we're reaching 20,000 people. We're blessed by the ministry of Jesus Mike in church. Let's give a clap offering unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We welcome you. We thank God that you're joining us today from all over the world. It is not always morning wherever they are. Some are in evening time, early, bright early in the morning. Some are in midnight, but we thank God for the unity and the opportunity that God has given for us, the body of Christ, to come together as one. Let's open our Bible from Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8 to verse 10. This is the word of the Lord that God has given to our senior pastor, Prophet Reverend Dr. Stephen Francis, as the prophetic word for us to move in the days ahead, especially as we celebrated our first anniversary. So it's good for us to always read it together out loud so that we put ourselves to remembrance to what God is saying and that each and every day as we continue to move forward, we are going to continue to be reminded by the Word of God and Holy Spirit will give us a fresh understanding each time when the Word is being spoken. In the book of Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8 to verse 10, this is the promise that God has given to us and I want to invite all of us to read it together in unison. Can we do that? Isaiah chapter 65, verse 8 to verse 10. Let's read it in the count of three. One, two, and read. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. Verse 10, Sharon shall become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for herds to lie down, for my people who have sought me. Somebody say, Amen. God has called us from individualism to unity, for there is an anointing in the cluster. There is power in togetherness. Each one of us cannot function if we are independent grapes, right? But there is an anointing in the cluster. A cluster of grapes is then pressed. When the pressing happens, then you will have the wine. You cannot have wine just from a single grape. I'm here to declare unto you, this is what God has placed in my heart. It is not only talking about the church community. It is not talking about Jesus making church alone. But when God is saying that there is anointing in the cluster, I want to proclaim in the name of Jesus, it means you and your household, you and your family, you and your spouse, your children and your grandchildren, they will be a cluster where God will release a fresh anointing. Somebody say amen. God wants you to fight for your family. If you're part of this church and some of you are praying and interceding and believing God for your family for many years, there is good news from heaven. God is releasing the anointing now for you to see the breakthrough that you've been waiting for. For it is not enough for just one or two in the family. You have to have the faith to say, as for me and my house, we will become the cluster of God. I pray you will have the zeal. Like you speak to many people that is non-related to you about God. It is time for you to open up your mouth and speak to your children. Speak to your grandchildren. They might not listen in the past, but now there is a new anointing from heaven. When you speak, your word will carry a fresh authority. And they cannot deny what the Spirit is saying for this very moment. Somebody say, Amen. No matter how difficult your situation might be, no matter how tough your family members are, if God can do a mighty work in your life, it is a testament that God can do the same in their life. All things are possible. Say it together with me. All things Because we worship a God of all impossibilities. Somebody say amen. There is unity when we come together and it happens in your family as well. The message I have for this morning is God's new wine for the generations. Not only for your generation, but for the generation that is to come. God brought this church here so lives are transformed and lives are changed. It begins with you. It is not about making the church big. 
It is not about our growing the sanctuary. That is good. That is great. And I believe that will be the byproduct of when the Spirit of God is being poured out. But it can be three people, four, five, or six gathered in a place. When the Spirit of God is in that place, when the Word of God is being preached, that three and four will become the catalyst of the move of God. That's why the inner process will begin to change and the inner workings of Holy Spirit will begin to take place. You don't want to be in a church where you're only tickled because a message is good. If every time you hear the message Sunday after Sunday, something gets restless inside of you, don't reject and resist the new, but say, Holy Spirit, help me because I'm tired of the same old Christianity trying to look good in front of my friends trying to look okay in front of my church friends, but I'd rather, God, you mess me up, but my life will never be the same. The church needs to get out from pride. And pride is thinking as a Christian, everything needs to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Somebody say amen. God is not asking for people in the church. You might not be using a medical mask, but don't be masking yourself with the lie that you put on on yourself. Because God cannot be mocked and God is not blind. He sees you when you're down. He sees you when you're depressed. He sees you when you're not serving. He sees you when you're sitting on your armchair. And God wants you to be whole, whether in church or outside of church. Some of us are bogged down because we're too ashamed to admit what is happening in our house, what is happening on our children. It's not good for us to be ashamed. We should be frustrated and we should be saying, God! If you don't show up and do something about it, I'm not satisfied. Amen. A new wine is being released to the generations. We have the old, we have the adults, we have the young adults, we have the youth, and we have the children. It is not only speaking of age categories. It's not only speaking that God, you know, when we talk about the younger kids, we are saying there, yes, they are the next leaders. Yes, they are the future of the body of Christ. But whatever age category you belong to, when you're hearing the word of God in a now period, it means God has a plan for your generation. The blending of the generations is when every single age category will do their part and they will hold hand together as one. Because God has no expiration date. The anointing and the call of God in your life has no expiration. The goal should be that we will do and we will run our race, not slow down until we see Jesus face to face. So if you are still here today and breathing and living and given the opportunity by God to wake up every morning, every day is a fresh start from heaven for you to be the best that God has called you to be. And as I was meditating and thinking about this, and I keep reminding myself of what God has told us last week through Pastor Stephen, the warnings of what can destroy the new wine, we read from the book of Zephaniah. I was brought by God to the book of Genesis and he brought me to study the life of a man by the name of Noah. Let's open our Bible together from Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 to 27. When God raised up Noah in his generation, the Bible says that God intended to bring destruction on the face of the earth because there was corruption found. And the corruption that was mentioned in the book of Genesis is that God saw that the earth is violent and that the flesh, all flesh, had corrupted the way of life. Two things. When corruption takes place, you will see violence. Number two, you will see flesh becomes the center point of everything. And that is what's happening in our generation today. People are ridiculously violent for no reason they beat up people in the open space they mock and berate other people's life on social media platforms human trafficking sex trafficking abortion you can name all the evil that is happening it is violent to a whole new level because violence is the product of corruption number two the flesh now takes the preeminent in people's life. What I feel, what I want, if it's comfortable for me. People don't exercise patience 
They don't exercise loving kindness anymore because it's all about the flesh. They don't think about the future. Everything is about the now. Everything about satisfying the temporary without thinking the consequence that will come because of the actions that we make. What is happening in the days of Noah is happening today. But God is raising up a generation like Noah who is not drunk in corruption but who's filled with new wine, but we need to learn from the life of Noah how he succeeded and why God spared him among all the rest in his generation and a mistake that he did before his life ended. Genesis chapter 9 verse 20, it was very interesting when I found out and when I read this scripture. It says, Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. The first Ever recording of a vineyard planted was by this man Noah. You will not find a recording before Noah of a vineyard being planted. Whether at that time part of the corruption was people was getting drunk and alcoholism began the corruption that was on the earth at that time, the Bible did not tell us that. But the Bible says Noah, after the flood, became a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. Verse 21, the Bible says, He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. We're going to read about, we, we're going to study it together this morning and see so that we're not making the same mistake that he made. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Verse 23, then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards and they did not see their father's nakedness. Next verse. When Noah awoke from his wine, and I want you to underline that. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, what did Noah do? He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, when God created a new beginning, the first curse that was pronounced after the curse of Adam was this curse. When Noah got drunk because of the wine, he laid uncovered. It's as if what happened in the Garden of Eden, it happened again. When God just made a brand new covenant with Noah. So something went wrong. And we as a church needs to understand, but first we want to know, who is Noah? In the sight of God, you can just write it down. We're not going to read it now. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 9, Noah was first known as a righteous man who is blameless in his generation. Just like his forefather, the Bible says, Noah walked with God. God is looking for people in this generation who will walk with God. Blameless, righteous. How much more because of the work of the cross? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, he made the impossible possible. He says, be holy for I am holy. Noah was able to walk blameless and righteous in his generation without the offering of the blood of Jesus. Yet, how much more you and I for such a time as this, when we have grace, when we have the mercies of God, when we have the Holy Spirit as our teacher, as our counselor, as our advocate who is fighting for our behalf every day and who our Lord Jesus is making intercession for us every single day. But no one was a man who's righteous. Unfortunately, many times in all the arsenal that God has given to us, we forget what it means to walk with God. We forget what it means to be blameless and righteous. Instead of being not like the world, we want to be accepted by the world. We compromise and we begin to mix the things of God and the things of the world and begin to walk at the edge where we're not exactly just tipping over to hell, but you know what? Things that I can compromise, I know God understands. 
But an invitation of salvation came to Noah, not because Noah was walking on the edge, because Noah lived blameless and righteous before God. If you read a few verses on top of Genesis chapter 6, you will see that Noah understood that there is a call of God in his life. Because Noah was discipled by his father, Lamech. And the Bible gives us the proof. I'll take you to where it says. Genesis chapter 5, verse 28. I want you to pay attention and you see the history of Noah. Noah did not just become righteous out of the blue. No, I believe Noah understood there was a prophecy given to him when he was born. So he was raised in the ways of God. See, our God is a God that walks from generation to generation. We cannot forget that. The principle of the kingdom has never changed. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Every time we have an offspring, by the grace of God, I think many of you know, this verse takes a very special meaning to me as now my wife is conceiving our first child and I'm going to be a father soon. So now I understand my goodness. There is a responsibility that God has given. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. He fathered a son. Right now, what God is raising up in the body of Christ is fathers and mothers, spiritually be matured believers who knows how to father a generation. Next verse 29, and called his name Noah. It was the prophecy. Saying out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. What a powerful prophecy. This one, this one named Noah is going to bring relief and he's going to turn the curse around. Noah grew up with that understanding in the ways of God. No, Noah stewards the anointing that is over him. I want to remind us, how many of you have received at least one prophecy in your life? What do you do with that prophecy? Is your life matching to the prophecy? Because a prophecy is an invitation from heaven. If you're willing to walk the walk, the prophecy will surely come to pass if it's from the mouth of the Lord himself. But many people love prophecy, but they're not willing to do the hard work. God says to Noah, you yourself, build yourself an ark. You read Genesis chapter 6, that's what God says. You, Noah, you, you, not me, you built yourself an ark. I give you the blueprint. I'll tell you what it's going to be made out of. I tell you the dimensions of the ark, but you yourself built an ark. But many times, we as believers, we fall short. You receive a blueprint from God. Hallelujah, good, but we're not building. We're happy talking about the blueprint. Talking about what God is going to do, talking about the prophecies in your life will get you nowhere. Obeying and doing will get you somewhere. You will never read in your Bible, Noah begin to tell people, hey, hey, God is telling me to build an ark, hey, repent. No, no, no. Noah was not being a busybody trying to tell God, hey, do you know something unusual is about to happen? No, Noah was focused on building the ark. He's going to reap some people mocking him. What in the world are you doing? At that time, the people of the earth have never seen rain before. But people are provoked not because of Noah's words. People are provoked because of Noah's, diso because of Noah's obedience to God. But this time around, in our generation, many Christians like to talk. Many prophets love to talk unnecessarily. The true prophets of God speak the word of the Lord and they don't mix their opinions. The more you talk, the more you speak unnecessarily and add your opinions, we miss the whole point that God wants us to build and not yap. 
But many Christians are satisfied with yapping. But the ark is never built. When God says, you built yourself an ark. When you talk, people will fight back at you. And don't tell me it's you righteously defending the word of the Lord. It's you reaping what you sow because of your blabbery mouth. But when you build out of obedience, when people start talking and mocking, you're not going to be easily frustrated because you know I have a mission at hand. Lives are changed when they see how you build your ark. Do you know that the ark speaks of the cross? The ark that Noah built to God's divine intervention because he shut the door of the ark when Noah and his family were inside. But it took the hands of Noah to build the ark. In the same manner, a life that is conformed to the cross is because of the divine power of God, the grace of God, and His Holy Spirit. But number two, it is because of the hard work, the obedience, the tears that you sow in building a life conformed to the death and the suffering of our Lord Jesus. The false doctrine now says, we live by grace. Don't do nothing. Everything is okay. No. When you know that God, out of His mercy, has given you a way where there seems to be no way, you will not take that privilege from God lightly. You have to be in the cross. The cross has to be an ark over your life that protects you, that guides you until when the flood comes, when the judgment comes, it is not your mouth that will save you, but it is the work that you've done because of obedience to God. Not because of an ark that you built yourself out of your own blueprint. Noah worked hard, but it was not his creative thinking. Many people these days have creative thinking. If I do this, surely God will be pleased. If I do that, surely God will be pleased. If I do this, surely God will be pleased. But the question is, has God told you to do it or not? If we start to focus on our doing, then it is not in reliance to the mercies and the grace of God, but it's because of our own might, our own strength, and our own power. But when we work and toil because of obedience, the obedience is putting Jesus as the center, the captain, the covering, the head over everything that we do. The Bible repeatedly said in Genesis chapter 6, Noah obeyed, Noah obeyed, exactly like the Lord said. Not more, not less. Are we building our ark? Is the cross just a nice story that we cry and tear every time? Thank you, Jesus. Or are we living in that cross? You want to talk about being a remnant? A remnant is one who is found in the cross. Conform to the death of Christ. Whatever you say, I'll do, Lord. No matter how ridiculous it might sound, I'll do it because you said so. And time will tell whether the ark that we're building is our own ark or is it the blueprint that God has given on the cross for you and for me. Can somebody say, Amen? The remnant in these last days are those in the cross, living a life in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God that one of the anointing of the new wine in the cluster is that God is going to teach us about intercession and prayer. Because remember, when Noah offered an offering to God, his intercession brought about salvation to the earth and the living creatures in it. When Noah burnt an offering after the flood passed, when God smelled the sweet smelling aroma, he says, never will I do this again. Jesus says, the Bible says, God says, because I know man's heart is corrupt since youth. That's what the Bible says. But God says, I will never do it again. I will not destroy the earth. 
I will not destroy the living creatures because of the works of men again. When Noah made intercession to God, he brought salvation to the generations that comes after him. Even the sign that God has for that covenant, which is the rainbow, until now, our generation is still witnessing the promise that God made to Noah. An everlasting covenant. Can somebody say amen? But something happened with Noah. A man that walked blameless before God. A man that was righteous. And God says, I will spare you, Noah. And create a new lineage. If you read in the book of Genesis and you pay attention to the promise that God gave to Noah, it's similar to the promise that God gave to Adam. When he says, be fruitful and multiply. God reinstated his original intent through Noah's descendant. Now Noah became the father of the new population that will populate the earth. God made that covenant with Noah. But something happened. Why did he make the crucial mistake? That because of something that he did, a curse was pronounced over his own son. I see that in the book of Genesis, before Abraham came along, it was God who walked with a certain individual that he will pass a few generations, boom, then suddenly there is a moment that God chooses somebody. But when God worked in the life of Abraham, it was from generation to generation with no end. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. If God has looked upon each and every one of us, and God says, you, whom I want to do something wonderful through your life, are we willing to leave a true legacy that the gen generations that will come after us, be it our own children, be it our own grandchildren, or the spiritual children that God gives you, do you know that every single one of us, we are called to be spiritual fathers and mothers? It's not about the age. It's about you bringing back the lost sons and daughters to the kingdom of God. When you win souls for the kingdom of God, and when you teach them the ways of God, you become a spiritual papa or a spiritual mama for that individual. That mandate is there over every single believer in Jesus Christ to be fruitful and to multiply. Or are we going to be selfish believers? As long as I know, as long as I'm safe, as long as I've got it, I'm okay. That's not the way of Christ. That is not the heart of Jesus. That is not what is in the mind of God. And we want to study together and learn what happened to Noah? Let's go back to the book of Genesis chapter 9 verse 20. I want you to see. The Bible says Noah began to be a man of the soil. The word began in the Hebrew is the word shalal. C-H-A-L-A-L. -A -L. And I was surprised to find out that this word began was used with other different meanings. And this word shalal has also a meaning that says to pollute or defile. When Noah began to be a man of the soil, there was a corruption that took place somewhere. When it says Noah began, one of that word began, the other meaning of the word shalal is to pollute or defile. And he became a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. Like I mentioned to you, we don't know. Before God brought about the flood, whether vineyards were planted on earth, whether that is one of the corruption that took place. People were getting drunk in wine. The Bible didn't say that. But somehow Noah had the understanding to plant a vineyard. He knew the product of that vineyard and he became drunk in the product of the vineyard, which is the wine. But remember when God gave a covenant to Noah, 
What did God say to Noah? Be fruitful and multiply. Noah became a farmer. The question is, did God call Noah to be, to be a farmer? When God made the covenant with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all there and they heard the voice of the Lord and the covenant that God made. But one way I can tell you that that fear of the Lord was not passed down to the next generation was the descendants of Noah were the ones who started the building of the Tower of Babel. If Sam, Ham, and Japheth knew that God says, I will not do this again, then why was the descendants of Noah so afraid of that kind of flood happening again that they conspired as a whole to say, we will build a tower that will reach the heavens? You see, there was a corruption that happened in the descendants of Noah that they did not fear God. They had no relationship with God like how his father had a relationship with God. Do you see that? Do you see that? God wants you and I, brothers and sisters, to be planted in God's vineyard. Not our own vineyard. Many times we do things. It is not God. It is the flesh. Doing things about God is not the same as doing things that are of God. Because when we do the things of God, divine wisdom and counsel will empower us to steward what belongs to God in a responsible way. And the fruit will always be blessings and not curse. God's new wine is for the generations. Understand people of God, when God releases an anointing, it is so that that anointing will be sustained to the generations to come. Many people are just interested in the past revivals. It's all about the gifts. It's about the oohs and the ahs. The oohs and the ahs fade. But what is missing is the product of a generation that fears God because of the oohs and the ahs. But we can see examples of how a legacy was left behind. For example, the story of the man of God by the name of Reinhard Bonke. He has physical children, but he passed down the baton to a man whom he knew was selected by God. He gave everything. A multi-million dollar ministry that has impact over thousands and millions of people. What I observe from the life of Evangelist Bonker, maybe the last five, six years of his life, when he knew that it's time for him to pass the bait into the next generation, he settled and he rest. But what he did was this. He mentored the next generation of evangelists that will rise after him. Because the focus is not self. Because he knew the vineyard that he has is not his vineyard. It's the vineyard of the king. God wants you and I to be planted in his vineyard. In his vineyard means his way. Sometimes being in the vineyard of God it is going to cost our comfort. We have a choice. Do things our way for God in the name of ministry, in the name of glorifying God, but it is not what God has instructed you to you do. It is not where God wants you to be. But in the planting of God is you do exactly what God tells you. I like what Sister Jackie says. Even though it might not be as popular, as some other things that you can do that can attract the attention from the mass crowd. The things of God will leave good fruit and good legacy. It will not die. And I believe that's what's happening in these end times because God says, as how he prophesied to John the Baptist, in the same manner to this generation who's preparing for the second coming of our Lord, the hearts of the children will be turned to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the children. There is a continuum. You continue 
and you pass down the legacy. That is discipleship. The ministry of the Lord Jesus did not die when he was ascended to when he ascended to heaven. The ministry of the Lord Jesus flourished because of the fruits that were produced in the vineyard of his father. That is the mark of the new wine that God is going to do. What God is starting in Shelby, North Carolina in this moment is not only a continuation of the past. The past is done. God is starting a new thing. Through the mistakes, through the pauses that happened in the past, God divinely supersedes the mind of man and He works through the weakness of man. But now when God has planted a vineyard, are we willing to be stewards of this vineyard until we see generations after this, they will not forget what God has done. It takes hard work. It takes discipleship. It takes stewardship. Let us not be like Noah. He got drunk in the wine. The wine speaks of the anointing, of the manifestation of God's power. Yes, we love that. But many times people are only searching after experiences. The moment you wake up from that experience, you have a big fat zero. The wine of the Spirit does not make us drunk and unaware of what is happening. There are times it will manifest in a service. There are times it will manifest when the Holy Spirit is being poured out. People will laugh because of the Holy Ghost. People will roll because of the Holy Ghost. But after the laughing and the rolling, when you wake up, you know exactly what God wants you to do. And you keep on marching forward in the assignment. I believe with all my heart in the, this generation, in the past, people have been dissuaded because of the experience. They forgot what truly mattered. When God says, be fruitful, be multiply, teach the generations after you about the ways of the Lord. That's what happened to Noah. He failed because he got drunk in his own wine. He laid uncovered back to the Garden of Eden. His younger son, Ham, dishonored his father. The Bible didn't write there was a sexual thing that happened there or anything further by just Ham looking. But instead of covering his father what Ham did, Ham went outside and told Shem and Japheth about the uncovering of his father. It speaks of the dishonor, disrespect that Ham had towards his father. It shows that Noah was not doing a good job in raising his children in the ways of Amen. It speaks of character. It speaks of raising the next generation, our children, our grandchildren, your spiritual children, to walk in the manner how Christ would walk. We cannot say because that person is anointed, that person has a free pass to do whatever he wants. It doesn't happen like that. It's not because, oh, when well, every time that person is dancing and singing and moving, God is always moving. It means whatever that person's life can be is a free pass. No. Because God looks at what is in the heart. God looks at the character of a person. God looks at what is many times unseen from the outside, but can only be seen by the audience of one. Can somebody say, Amen? The next generation must not see the nakedness of the previous generation. But the generations must learn to walk together. The younger generation must honor what God is doing through the previous generation. And the previous generation must speak blessings to the next generation. Because when your next generation is blessed, your generation is honored by God. Amen. God willing, when Jesus Christ comes, we're all still going to be here. But some of us might not. But the question is, what legacy will you leave behind for the glory of God? Because when you leave that legacy behind, your name is not forgotten. That is the beauty of multiply. That is the beauty of make disciples of all nations, 
for the glory of God. I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, before 2021 ends, bring one soul to Jesus and disciple them in the ways of God. Teach them. Mentor them. Guide them. They don't have to come to Jesus, my King Church. But one thing that is sure, they have to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Just like how you have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Be fruitful and multiply. That is God's will over our lives. Every single one of us are equipped with different gifts and abilities and talents for us to succeed in whatever call that God has for you and for me. Can somebody say amen? Now, I want to give you five things this morning of how the new wine will be a blessing to the generations that are to come. If you are now hungry for God and you are saying, Lord, teach me, guide me and mentor me, then have the right mentality in how you approach the leadership that God has over your life. In the same manner, when now as you mature in your journey with God and you are preparing yourself to mentor the next generation, be it your own children, grandchildren, or the people who are younger at age, or maybe they are new born-again believers who are not as seasoned as you in your journey of faith with Jesus, then prepare yourself in how you can pass on the anointing to the generations that are to come. That's why it's important for us to be connected with the right spiritual mentors whom you can respect. Admire somebody not only because of the anointing, Admire someone not only because of the gifting. Admire someone because you can say, your walk with Jesus is so real, I can see it, it's tangible, I want the same thing that you have. That will last you a long time. Many times people are just attracted to the gift, they don't know how that person is as a husband or as a wife at home. You don't know how that person is as a father or as a mother at home. You don't know how that person is as a neighbor in the neighborhood. You don't know how that person lives just as a normal human being. We're only captivated by the anointing. It's all about the anointing, the giftings, the anointing, the giftings. How about the life? That is tangible. That when you look at a person, you can say, the obedience that this person does is not only just spoken from his or her mouth, but I can see the fruit of that obedience. That person is actually practicing long-suffering. That person is actually practicing patience. It's easy for people to quote Genesis chapter 12 and say, look at Abraham. God told that person to go to a place where he has never been before. God didn't even know. God didn't even tell Abram where he's supposed to go. But Abram had the faith and the courage to say, wherever you go, I'll go, Lord. But it's different from you seeing somebody in your generation who's willing to leave all that they know all their life behind to a place like Shelby, North Carolina. That he didn't, he didn't even know existed on the map of the earth. That is the legacy. Obedience. Obedience. Obedience to God. What legacy will we leave behind? The anointing and the power of God is great. But now, God is not going to have broken and burst wineskin. But He will have wineskin that becomes together with the new one. It's because that wineskin is willing to go through the breaking point. That wineskin is willing to go through the process to be strengthened and molded and stretched for the glory of God. Five points. Are you ready? Open your Bible to Numbers chapter 27, verse 18 to 20. Look at the con what God has done in the life of Moses, passed down to the life of Joshua. The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Next verse. Make him stand before Eleazar, the priest, and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest him with some of your authority, that all the congregation of the people of Israel 
may obey. Point number one, write this down. Go back to verse 18, please. Brother Colin, the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit. That's point number one. A man in whom is the spirit. Jesus Miking Church was started on Pentecost Day in 2020. The emphasis on our first year anniversary was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Joshua was known as a man in whom is the Spirit. It's important to walk in His Holy Spirit, to be led by His Spirit, to be guided by His Spirit. I studied the Word and I saw there's two more times when the Bible mentions a man, in whom is the Spirit? The second person is Joseph in Genesis chapter 41, verse 38 to 40. Joseph was a man in whom is the Spirit? Genesis 41, verse 38 to verse 40. I want you to see it. The importance of being filled with the Spirit of God. Genesis chapter 41 verse 38 to verse 40. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? A heathen, a non-believer. The Pharaoh of a nation can recognize something is different with this man. Look at that. You know why? Not because Joseph made perform miracles. No. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. Spirit filled believers, when God wants a man who's so filled with the Spirit, that man or that woman is marked by what? Wisdom and discernment. Not always the showy part of the anointing, but having the common sense when to talk and when not to talk. What to say and, not, and what not to say. To discern, is this right or not? Is this God or not? Is this opportunity God or not? That is the mark that Pharaoh can recognize, he says, the Spirit of God is in you, Joseph. Why? Because you are so wise and you are so discerning. Amen. You know why Joseph was promoted? He was promoted because he was responsible. Spirit-filled believers are responsible. You cannot pass down legacy to the next generation if you are not willing to steward what God has for you. Then how can the next generation learn how to walk in a responsible manner? Remember, Joseph did not just become like that. He had a father by the name of Jacob who loved him, who lavished him with love. Don't only just pay attention of the multicolor coat that Jacob gave to Joseph. Joseph obeyed every time the father says, go tend the sheep with your brothers. There was a discipline that was instilled in the life of Joseph. Joshua had Moses as his mentor. Joseph had his father as his mentor. There is an involvement of discipleship and fathering in the life of spirit-filled believers. The second person whom I studied and I found that the Bible also mentioned that the Spirit of the Lord was found in that person is about Judge Othniel in the book of Judges chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 10. I want you to open it. The second person, the third person, I should say, after Joshua, after Joseph, where the Bible explicitly said, the Spirit of the Lord was upon this man. It says, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Next verse, next verse, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel he went out to war and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim king of Mesopotamia into his hand 
and his hand prevailed over Cushan. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. He judged Israel and he went out to war. Othniel, a judge. Maybe some of us have not read about Othniel before. I encourage you open Judges chapter 3 and study more about his life. He got married to the daughter of his uncle and his uncle happens to be Caleb. The man who stood with Joshua. Despite of all the giants in the land, Caleb and Joshua said, my God is greater than the enemy. That Caleb. Caleb as an old man entered the promised land saying to Joshua, you give me Hebron and I will take back Hebron for the glory of God. Othniel was in the same kin as this Caleb. There is a legacy that you leave behind. Who ever thought that one of Caleb's descendants carried the spirit of a war? The wine that Caleb received, it was passed down to the next generation. God does not want the new wine to die in one generation. He wants it to be passed down from generation to generation to generation. Can somebody say, Amen? When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Othniel, Othniel was not like Joseph. The Bible did not say that he was a discerning and he was a wise man, but he was a man of war. There is time for the church to be violent. There is time when the manifestation of the Spirit will come. You will fight to the death until all that God has for you is received. When the Spirit of God is upon you, when you talk to your children, when you talk to other people, use wisdom and discernment. But there is time you need to boldly declare the word of the Lord. You see how the Spirit works? It brings a great balance that instead of chaos, it gives you the result that you're looking for. Amen. What we want from Jesus Miking Church, every single one of us, when Shelby community, North Carolina, and even the nations meet us, they will always smell the fragrance of Christ. They're so wise. They speak with discernment. But when they're looking for people who knows how to fight, they will say, they are warriors in the hand of God. Somebody say amen. A man who, whom is the spirit of God. You can read it at home in Judges chapter 1, verse 11 to 15, about Othniel. He got married to Caleb's daughter, Aksa. In the story in Judges chapter 1, verse 11 to 15, you'll read it at home. Caleb and his wife knew how to ask for a blessing from Caleb. Caleb's daughter asked Caleb, Give me your land. And Caleb Pass down a legacy to his daughter and son-in-law. There is fathering. The previous generation knows how to bless the next generation. And the next generation knows how to ask for the blessing of the previous generation. That's why God wants family restored. If you are a child no matter how bad your parents might be, you have a heavenly father who loves you. That you can leave a legacy for the children that will come after you. Amen? Number two, going back to Numbers chapter 27. Can we go back to Numbers 27 verse 18? Point number two. The Bible says, And lay your hand on him. Write this down. Unity comes through impartation and submission to godly leadership. The laying of hands is not just talking about we come to a conference and we have a speaker of our choice lay hands on us. It 
It's not enough for us to pride. So and so laid hands on me. So what? You want the Lord Jesus to lay hands on you. When Moses laid hand on Joshua, it's not just another prophetic act of an impartation. I found the secret in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Impartation happens when we learn how to submit. This verse gives us the proof. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for Moses had laid his hands on him. The impartation that happened in Joshua's life was the spirit of wisdom came upon Joshua. Do you see that? Impartation speaks of wisdom because wisdom empowers you to live. Wisdom gives you the guidance in how you need to bring yourself before God and before people. The anointing is needed for the assignment that God has for you. But wisdom is required in living. You need both. Anointing and wisdom. Impartation speaks of not only the laying of hands, but the time that you're willing to spend. You want to see God do wonderful things in your life? In Jesus my King, submit to the vision and don't easily quit. When the correction comes, when the scolding comes, when the molding comes, don't run. Submit then you will receive the impartation from heaven. Number three. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 27. Because all five points is in these two verses. It's number, in Numbers 27, verse 18 to verse 20. Number three. Numbers 27, verse 18. Go to verse 19, please. Make him stand before Eleazar, the priest, and all the congregation, that you shall commission him in their sight. Write this down. Commission in their sight. What does that mean? Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 28. The Bible says, but charge Joshua, encourage and strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. Commissioning speaks of encouragement, strengthening, and charging. Do you see that? Next verse, Deuteronomy 31, verse 7 to 8. Why is it important for Joshua to be commissioned in front of the priests and the congregation? Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 7 to 8. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land, that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or dismay. You see that? It sounds very much like Joshua chapter 1. The leadership that Moses provided for Joshua, the mentorship that Moses provided for Joshua is not done in secret, it's in public. So when Joshua had the strength to speak to the people, the people recognized that he got it from his spiritual father. Brothers and sisters, encourage your sons and your daughters 
in the assignment that God has over them. Push people to know their calling in God. You want to submit yourself to leadership who recognize the potential that God has for you. A godly leadership will always point you to Jesus. Will always point you to His will over your life. They will not point you to themselves. They will point you to know God more. They will point you to know God's will over your life. They will not flatter you. They will not misuse you. But they will point you to the right direction. In the same manner, God desires for us to learn. If we want to be a blessing to other people, it's not always agreeing with them, but you correcting them when correction is needed. It's not just kumbaya, everybody is okay. It's good for us to say, good job, brother and sister, good job. But it's important as well to admonish people to walk in the ways of God, but in love. Many times parents have weakness. If it's their kids, everything must be good about their kids. I'm saying to myself, when my children make mistakes, am I willing to correct them when correction is necessary, even in public? Because children need to know that my parents are serious in how I conduct myself and behave myself. Good parents are not the one who just keep on defending your kids. Nope. Because your goal is to raise them up in the ways of God. Amen? A healthy church is a church that when correction is needed, you will be corrected. Scolding is needed. It's not out of a hatred. Because discipline is part of the package of the kingdom of God. That's why when Moses encouraged Joshua, he encouraged Joshua in front of the people. I don't think Moses said this, Joshua, you'll make it. Be strong, okay? No. It's okay, Joshua. But I believe Moses with a stern voice. Be strong! Because the people is looking at you, Joshua. But Joshua didn't cower. Joshua knew he was being equipped to carry on the assignment that God has and the destiny that was waiting for the nation of Israel. So when Joshua said almost the same thing in the book of Joshua, his speech had strength. Because you know why? He first was equipped through that word. When he speaks the word, it is not just empty words. Now Joshua is saying, because I've been through it, it's your turn, people of God. Go through it. That's the legacy of strength that is passed down from generation to generation. Amen? Point number four. Back in Numbers chapter 27, the Bible says this. Numbers 27, verse 20. You shall invest him with some of your authority. Point number four. Underline that word or that statement. You shall invest him with some of your authority. The word invest in Hebrew is the word Nathan. N-A-T-A-N, which means a transfer. Invest is the word investment. You see that? You shall invest him with some of your authority. When you invest on something, you don't invest blindly. You take time to research. You take time to study. The original Hebrew from in, for invest is the word transfer. You transfer something that is inside of you. You transfer something that you have. True discipleship is always genuine. Discipleship doesn't work if you don't want to be discipled. The disciples of Jesus became excellent disciples because they are willing to be discipled by Jesus. When they are willing to be discipled, Jesus did not treat the 12 the same like how he treated the mass. 
He treated the 12 with extra care, extra patience over time because what he had, he transferred to the 12. Discipleship is more specific because Jesus knew his ministry is not ending when he ascended to heaven. This 12 will continue his ministry. That's why Moses invested his authority, some of his authority to Joshua. Find mentors who are genuine in their intention of pouring into your life. In the same manner, we can only be effective in preparing the next generations if our heart is genuine towards the next generation. It takes love, it takes care, it takes patience. I wonder why it says you shall invest him with some of your authority. You know why? It takes the exercise of wisdom to know what is necessary for the next generation to have to carry for their assignment. Moses did not invest all of his authority, but some. Amen. He invested to Joshua what Joshua specifically needs for him to fulfill what God has for him. And last but not least, number five. Numbers 27 verse 20. This is powerful. You shall invest him with some of your authority that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. Underline those, that sentence. That all the people may obey. Obedience in a people, unity in a people can only happen when true fathering takes place. The impact of Moses recognizing Joshua, the impact of Moses and Joshua, the two generations learning how to run together, an impartation of obedience was taking place over the people. Amen. Amen? There is power when your family is restored. There is power when you can say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't give up. Fight for it until you get it. Why? Because when you see the generations are restored, you manifest the intention of God. That is to see divine families raised up on planet earth that will make impact that people will be influenced and they too will be sucked in and taken in as part of the family of God. Joshua chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. This is the fulfillment of this statement. Joshua chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. I want you to watch this. Okay? Now, this is not Joshua speaking. This is now the people speaking. Watch what they say. They answered Joshua. Okay? Watch that. The people now is answering Joshua. All that you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. My goodness. Don't we wish to be part of this kind of church? Right? Verse 17. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Oh, verse 18, power. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your word, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. My God. God wants us, Jesus, my King Church, to be an army. An army that can say to our leaders, whatever you tell us to do, we'll do it. Wherever you tell us to go, we'll go. Why? Because we know God is with you. Joshua, you be strong and be of good courage. This is unity in the house of God. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. 
A healthy fathering and discipleship will produce a generation that is united. This generation is looking for spiritual leaders who walk with God and whose walk with God is real and evident. And you know what? God is raising up a people who's zealous for order in the house of God. And I believe God is raising up a body of Christ in this end time will have the zeal to destroy the virus of rebellion and disobedience. Rebellion and disobedience has been a virus in the church for too long. And God is raising up a people, a united people. When the generations come together, you don't look at color of the skin, you don't look at age, you don't look at background, you don't look at whatever. All you see is one. Jesus revealed in your midst. Somebody say amen. This is the power of the new wine. In the midst of the chaos, the world is trying to look for strength in the house of God. The people said, you be strong and be good courage. We will walk with you as long as you will walk strong with God. Can God find strength in the house of God for such a time as this? Amen? I will close by saying this. We are on the verge of the greatest revival and awakening that we have ever known. God wants us to be united. The generations will come together. It will start with you. It will start with your children. It will start with your grandchildren. It will start with your spiritual children. It will start with us, the church, learning how to run together as one. In the book of Genesis, remember, when God pronounced judgment, because he says, all flesh has corrupted their ways. Remember that? God says, all flesh has corrupted. I'm here to tell you in Joel chapter 2, 28, the remedy, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What we're going to see in the days to come is not judgment, but it's an awakening and an army that will rise up for the glory of God. When there was corruption, when God is looking for spirit-filled individuals, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Upon all flesh. But are we willing to be the Noahs? Prepare the generations to come. Fight for your family. Fight for your children. In the body of Christ, fight for one another. If you're a grandparent, if you're an uncle and an auntie, be the best grandparents. Be the best spiritual aunts and uncles. Be the best spiritual fathers and mothers that you can be in the house of the Lord. That we will become so united that whatever God is going to tell JMK to do through our leader, Pastor Stephen Francis, we will say, whatever you say, we'll do it. Wherever you go, that's where we will go. Be strong and be of good courage. If we are going to see something different, then the way of living must be different. The concept must be different. How many of you wants the new wine? I want the new wine. The anointing and the wisdom. The Spirit of the Lord that will mature us. You know, if we study what pastor says, that in the Hebrew culture, wine plays a very important role in their diet, it means there is a secret there somewhere. Things that is not put in the perspective of God will corrupt us. Don't let our gifts, our talents, and our ability become a corruption because it's not submitted under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But what God has given to be good, let it be sustained when we learn to walk righteous, when we walk in the precepts of the Word of God. May God help each and every one of us for His kingdom to be established on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people say, let's stand in the presence of God.